Hi, this is Jeff from the Ozark Mountains in Missouri, USA. Well, today we're going to do a bit of an overview or a sneak peek that involves all of this stuff. Now, it is a pocket computer, but even if that's not your thing, this might interest you. Because what we're working on here, there is not a lot of development tools or uh, information available, say, like there would be for Commodore 64. So kind of putting all those things together and developing the tools you need to build the thing you want, well, that process is similar no matter what you're working on. So without further ado, let's jump right in. Thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring this episode. They offer an excellent quick turn PCB prototyping service, which now has a free upgrade to the 150-160 temperature range. And this is PCBWay's ninth anniversary and they're having lots of promotions, uh, coupons, sales, etc. So going over to PCBWay and check them out. What we have here is a Sharp PC-1500 with the CE-158 uh, RS-232 and parallel port interface. Well, actually, this is the Radio Shack version of the CE-158. It does not have the parallel port interface board, which is this guy. Otherwise, they're exactly the same, same ROM and everything. And of course, uh, the computer here could be a Terra City branded PC2, PC1500A or 1501 if you're in Japan, basically the same thing. A few years ago, I got to wondering if an SD card interface would be possible. And I made a breakout board, which contained an EEPROM and some address decoding logic and got it to run a program from the EEPROM. Here we are running the one column at a time screen invert off of an external EEPROM. Check it out. Using this little breakout board. Yeah, it's out of focus. I've been using LH Tools Assembler at this point, which is a great package, and it uses a Z80 like mnemonic set for the LH5801, which is the processor that is inside this computer. Now, being more familiar with TASM, the Telemark Assembler, which is a table-driven assembler, you can uh, create a new table to assemble almost anything. Um, I created a table for the LH5801 and added a custom assembly method to handle the unique branching of the LH5801. And I used the official Sharp mnemonic set. I did a video about this, which I'll put below. I did the initial disassembly of the CE158 ROM with LH Tools, and there were still some parts of the code I didn't really understand how it was working. So I wrote a simple uh, LH5801 uh, simulator program so I could run snippets of code and see what it actually did. And this was based off of the description of the opcodes given in the Sharp manual. Uh, this worked fairly well. It revealed a few discrepancies between the manual and how the computer actually worked. Um, the user interface is terrible and uh, it leaves a lot to be desired. After that, I uh, created my own disassembler kind of based on that simulator. Uh, very similar UI, it's equally as bad, but it let me use um, like a standard library file that an assembler might use. So you can have all the things in there you'd be using for assembling it as you're disassembling it and it makes the code that you get out a lot nicer. For the library files, I combined information from several different sources into one Excel spreadsheet. I added in some macros that will spit out a separate library file for the PC-1500, for the CE-158, for the CE-150, and it also outputs a memory map proper. This makes it really easy to update and maintain all of this once we find out new information. I had been talking about this for so long, I got a friend of mine interested. He's the guy that uh, invented such great things as the dial rom and the backpack drive. And one of the first things he wanted to try to do was get the backpack drive to work uh, in the serial interface here. 
And, you know, some of the challenges with that are the, the computer needs to tell the backpack drive the file name and whether it's a load or save operation. So my friend came up with a way to do that uh, by doing a printf from the, the computer first. And the drive interprets that as the command, you know, like a DOS command with a load or save in the file name. And then I came up with a... Uh, basic subroutines for save and load that kind of automated that process and the whole setup process because uh, using the serial interface you have to set the handshaking lines and configure the serial port and do some things like that before you can actually do what you want and it was kind of a pain and this kind of basic mini DOS thing kind of worked but it was pretty cumbersome and the next thing my friend tells me is, hey, I created a PC-1500 emulator using a TNC 4.1 and a custom board he designed with a PC-1500 type connector on it, like, like this. So this is emulating this or simulating this, uh, running at about, uh, well, we just bumped this up to about 600 megahertz now, and that's just because we're bit banging serial and things, but Anyhow, so we, he made a uh, PC-1500 development platform out of the Teensy, which lets you drive real hardware. That is just super cool. And, you know, you can do all the normal development stuff, set breakpoints, uh, dump memory, easily load files, uh, you know, things like that. It works really great. Plug it in with a USB cable. It opens up a couple virtual COM ports for you know uh, interfacing with it and sending files and things like that. This is super nifty. And then he comes up with this. This is a uh, what we're calling a CE158X for extreme. Let me think about that Stargate episode where the the strange alien guy is doing the wormhole extreme show because he says you know. Uh, X is supposed to be better and grab more of the millennial audience or, you know, something like that, something silly like that. So anyhow, this is the CE-158X. Uh, my friend found a TI chip that is two serial ports and a parallel port. So we have a serial port here, a parallel port here, and a USB port, which is the second serial port. Um, we're using a flash chip for ROM, set up like a dialer ROM so we can load multiple images at once. And yeah, we've got tape and blue botch wires and components tacked on uh, you know that's what you do with the development board you add and fix stuff as you learn more about what you're doing and of course this will plug into here and you can drive this board and set breakpoints and stuff with the simulator board you can plug this into the computer because the peripherals on the 1500 contain their own rom we can uh, modify the original ROM from this guy for here, plug it in here, and now the computer knows how to talk to this. It's brilliant. Uh, one other advantage of this is whereas the original CE-158 had a limitation of 2400 baud, we've tested this reliably up to 19,200 baud. Uh, it can go faster than that. We've tried 38 forward and it's not super reliable. So 19.2 might be the limit. But even then, you can, you know, fill up the entire memory on the Sharp in not very long. So that's great. Uh, we've also added a couple of new basic commands um, that make working with the backpack a little easier and changing between the two serial ports, the serial port here and the USB. Uh, the one command is called setUR for setUART. Uh, it has three possible options, set UR U0, which is this guy, set UR U1, which is this guy, and set UR BP, which actually sets it to COM0, uh, and it does some extra stuff automatically for use with the backpack drive. Uh, that way you can just type C load and C save with the file name, and it handles all the other stuff needed to get the file information to the backpack drive and sets the comp parameters and things like that. Makes it a lot nicer just to plug this in and load and save files. Now, one side effect of doing all this work is we realized that the, the baud rate generator clock in the 158 here 
uh, was actually fast enough to do uh, 9600 baud, but the a clock divider chip can't be set to a divide by one. So the best it could theoretically do is 4800 baud. And luckily, the ROM on the 158, this is one I have here I've been working on. Thus, I've got some uh, cloth in here to keep the two halves of it from shorting together. Uh, luckily, the pinout is almost exactly like a standard EEPROM, so I've got an EEPROM burnt here with some modified code, uh, which adds the set UR commands, uh, the UR string commands, which tells you the UR mode, and it enables up to 4800 baud. We had to lose the 50 baud, but you know, hey, who's going to try to talk to a teletype with their 1500 now. Uh, the same way with the higher baud rates on this guy, 4800, 9600, 192. We had to sacrifice 50, 100, 110 baud. I don't think anybody's going to miss those whatsoever. Uh, what work is less left to do on this? Well, a lot. Um, the USB functionality, we need to hash that out, how to make that easy and kind of seamless for the user to use. Uh, you know, you do, would do the, the idea is you do set UR U1, you would switch to this, and uh, then you can, you know, send files to a PC or something like that. Um, we thought maybe having a small PC based program that would kind of act like uh, the backpack, the kind of simplified backpack protocol that the, the the computer uses here uh, and make it easy to send files to your PC that would require some other reworking of the set UR stuff so it could use either port. I'll we'll have to see how that goes. Uh, some places in the ROM in this thing are fixed and hard to move around and it's really difficult to change. We have more flexibility in other places. The basic tables, there's not a lot of room around there. There's some fixed stuff around those that we can't move. So we'll have to see what, what we can do. Now, oh, as you can see, uh, we're using kind of a standard uh, lithium battery plug here and it's got the charger circuitry on board and I'm using this kind of relatively large battery. We're thinking about maybe using an uh, 18650 size that would set right in here and remote mounting the switch up on top of the case. Uh, I need to 3D or design a case and that can be 3D printed that this can set in that'll line up properly height wise with the computer. Um, things like that that we have left to do. Still a lot of work, but it's been a lot of fun. Uh, so, you know, one point of this video is to say, hey, you know, here we've got this thing we've been working on. And the other point is to say, if you have a project in mind where the amount of information about the computer is limited, the development tools are limited, you can still do it. You just have to take it kind of a step at a time. We had to kind of develop tools as we went and that let us learn more about you know, our, our equipment, our theoretical understanding, and we could go back and fix that. You know, we've learned more about the computer, gone back and fixed the simulator, uh, found out the way some of the uh, op codes were described in the manual from Sharp weren't exactly right, which were causing problems in the simulator, causing some problems in our code. So we could go back and fix those, that type of thing. Um, we've done this because it's fun. If you would be interested in a C158X, let me know. Uh, use the comment section down below, or if you look on my channel page in the about there's a way there you can contact me. Um, not sure what these would cost yet. These 60 pin high rows connectors are like 10 or 15 bucks a piece, depending on quantity. Um, and you know, this double stack connector is less expensive, but still a few dollars a piece. So uh, it'll probably be less than if you could find a C158 or a CE158. These guys are very difficult to find. When you can find one, it's not unusual to see them go over $100. If it's in really nice condition in a box and everything, it might be $150. And I haven't seen one available for months now. I've been looking in Japan and the United States. They're just not available.
Okay, I've got the PC1500 simulator plugged into the CE158X. Uh, it's turned on, but you notice we do not have the green power LED here because uh, the PC1500 has to be on to turn this guy on, just like in the original hardware. So if we turn this on by plugging it in, now we've got the green LED here. Power cycle the backpack there. And you'll notice on our uh, serial terminal here, it tells us that we've connected. Uh, I've got several options here. I can uh, simulate everything, the 158 and the backpack and the PC1500 all on the TNC. I can uh, use the ROM on the 158 or a ROM image on the TNC to talk to the real backpack, etc. I'm going to run a macro here, which starts it up using all the, the real hardware, the simulator, the 158X, and the real backpack. Now, this Part of the screen looks kind of funny at first. Basically, this is a text dump of what uh, each frame that's getting output to the PC1500 screen. It looks a little funny at first, but it's it's useful for seeing what has happened in the past. And if you just concentrate on this uh, last line down here, it kind of makes sense. Now. Uh, there's a bug in this version of the firmware, so I have to manually type out stat zero. That sets the handshaking lines for this serial port. Uh, that should be done automatically, but the uh, TI chip here does it differently than the original chip on the original hardware. I just power cycled the backpack there. Uh, on occasion, there's something left in the serial buffer or something that causes a problem. So just try to make this start up without a hitch. And now we can use the set UR to put it in backpack mode. We can check what mode we're in with UR string. These are commands that were added to the 158 ROM. And now if we do C load done, this is a 8K uh, pr basic program. That's like a dungeon exploring Dungeons and Dragons or Zork, that type of thing. And yeah, you'll notice it kind of seemed like it did nothing and now we're getting all these busies on the screen. Uh, this is an artifact of something I added to the ROM that blinks the busy indicator as it's loading. So on the simulator, it shows up kind of funky. It works great on the real thing. Uh, on the original ROM, when you're trying to load, it just sits there and does nothing and you don't know if it's accomplishing anything. And my friend said, hey, what if we add something, some type of progress indicator? So uh, since it turns on the busy enunciator anyhow on the LCD, we just are blinking it. Now we should have that file loaded in there. And well, it sort of worked. I don't know what happened here. Yeah, this sometimes happens on first startup. I don't know if it, yeah, it didn't actually load the program, so we'll try that again. This is something with a combination of the current simulator firmware and the hardware here. Uh, C load. Done. Yeah, okay, that time it worked fine. It's after that first time it works fine. That's why I think there's something in the uh, uh, serial buffer or something that's confusing the backpack. Now if we list, we can see the program is there. And that 8K program took you know just a few seconds to load. Of course, this is a simulator with the processor running at 600 megahertz. But uh, we can go ahead and try that on the real hardware. Uh, the real PC-1500 with the uh, 158X and see it does the same thing. 
Okay, now we have our PC1500 connected to the 158X, and once again, green power LED is not on. Turn the power on on the 1500. We get our green power LED on the 1500 or on the 158X. I'm going to go ahead and turn the backpack on and I need to do an out stat zero. I shouldn't need to do that, but I need to fix the firmware for the 158. And then we should be able to do a set UR to backpack mode. We can check that if we want with backpack string or UR string. It used to be called BP string. And we got to think about the two different UART settings. So we changed it to set UR and UR string, which kind of goes along with the other settings for the machine for the 158. Okay, so we're in backpack mode. Now we should be able to go C load forgot to you done and I'm going to zoom in here so you can see the busy indicator and it won't blink to start with and then as it starts transferring data it will blink it's not a real good shot but it's the best we can do without uh, a lot of reflection so the busy indicator will be just there i'm going to hit enter And there we go. See, it's blinking. It's loading data. Uh, the reason it doesn't blink to start with is because first the 1500 is sending the file name and telling the backpack it's a load operation. And then there is about a five second wait for everything to get kind of realigned. And then the loading takes place. So we just loaded uh, 8K from the backpack to the PC 1500 at 19,200 baud. And if I zoom out here just a little bit like that, I can go list. That is a really terrible look there, isn't it? That's a little better, but maybe not much. So we've got our file in there. And we can put it in run mode and run it. Dungeon Quest. Nineteen eighty-eight to two thousand two. So somebody kept up on it. Air twenty-one. Oh yeah, I remember I ran this before, and there was a problem when uh, I input it as a text file, and there was a problem in the OCR or something like that. So anyhow, I just need to update my version on the uh, backpack here. And if we do a com string, let's see if I can zoom back in here for you. Com string, it tells us we're at 19200 baud, and we can even do set com 38400, com string. This hasn't been reliable. I mean, the the chip here on the the TI chip on the 158X can handle that, but um, I'm not sure if we can get the 1500 and everything else happy with that. Uh, that's too fast for the backpack drive for the little microcontroller in there. But maybe if you're communicating with the computer, that type of thing. Just a bit of a brief demo. Still got some rough edges to sand down and you know things to tweak but it's working pretty good so far so this was an overview of this project it's been a lot of fun it's been a lot of work it's kind of interesting working on something where uh, there's not a lot known about a particular piece of equipment there's a uh, a fair amount of stuff about the PC-1500 itself and really nothing on the CE-158. So dumping that ROM and disassembling it and getting it into a place where you could actually modify it and build it and get a usable ROM out of it again, 
that was a challenge. Uh, my buddy doing the simulator and the 158X board, that was just amazing. He's such a whiz. And, you know, we've got this now in a kind of semi-usable state. It makes for a good development platform and being able to, you know, set breakpoints and stuff like that using the simulator is very handy, even though it's not perfect. It's not a clock cycle accurate version of the 1500, but that's okay. That's not what it was intended to be. It's a development tool. So if there's any part of this you would like to see more of, like using the simulator for development and setting breakpoints and all the things you can do with it, uh, the disassembly of the 158 ROM and the modifications in it, um, anything like that, just let me know and we can do a video and kind of delve deeper into those individual topics. We still have a lot of work to do. Uh, we've got to get the second eWart, which goes through the USB port here. We've got to get that functionality ironed out and make it kind of a, a seamless thing for the end user so they can use a set UR, U1 command, and then everything just goes through that and they don't need to think about it other than that. Um, there was still a glitch with the simulator you saw there. That's not a big deal. It works fine on the real hardware. Um, we're using a lithium battery for that, which is fine. They last a long time. We want to use a type of lithium cell that everybody can get locally. That way, if we make these later, if somebody's interested in buying one, uh, they can pick up that cell locally wherever they're at in the world. And it kind of eliminates the problem with trying to ship those uh, internationally or by air freight, which is always problematic and creates a lot of hassles. So if you have questions or if you might be interested in a 158X, if we do make some of these, uh, let me know. If you got questions, let me know. Um, I've got all this code and everything that I've done up on GitHub. I'll put the link below. It's not going to make a lot of sense right now. As I mentioned, the uh, LH501 processor simulator works but the user interface is horrible. And uh, if I haven't used it in a few months, I have to figure out how to use it all over again. And the disassembler is almost as bad, uh, but you know we're kind of involved in this hardware stuff now and eventually I'll get back to doing that. And uh, anyhow, let me know, have a look and leave your comments in that comment section down there below. Until next time.